I'd like to call forward the uh, U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazardous Investigation Board. And we are very honored to have with us uh, Chairperson Raphael Moray Rosso, Dr. Moray Rosso. If you come forward, and also we have with us Johnny Banks. And they are going to do a joint presentation situation. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for Thank you very much. Us. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting us here. I, I would like to, to thank the West Virginia Joint Legislative and Oversight Commission. I'm glad to see Mike here, too, uh, on water resources. Uh, we appreciate you inviting me to participate in this important hearing today. I am Rafael Moure Razo. I am the chairperson of the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, the CSB. Our primary mission is to investigate the root causes of industrial chemical disasters, such as the recent chemical release at Freedom Enterprises. We are a scientific, non-regulatory federal agency that makes recommendations to protect communities workers and environment from this type of tragedies. We not only investigate uh, how this type of accidents happen, but we also uh, try to find out why they happen. Uh, the CSB is a small federal independent agency with 41 employees, uh, half of whom are professional accident investigators with highly technical skills. Currently, the CSB has a investigate team here in Charleston with four members uh, and to investigate this particular incident in Freedom Enterprises. Heading the team is uh, the supervisory investigator, Mr. Johnny Banks, that will also be addressing you today. I, I would like to add that Mr. Banks is uh, the third time that conducts investigations in the state of West Virginia. He's the type of person that is recognized in the streets right now. Yesterday, the restaurant persons recognized Johnny as a, a, a CSB member. I think it's important that uh, discuss the history of the CSB uh, on different investigations that we have run in, in the Canoe Valley. This is our ter third deployment to a major chemical accident in the valley. In 2008, two workers were fatally injured at the Bayer Crop Science Chemical Plant in Institute when a waste tank containing the pesticide methyl meal violently exploded. Then in 2010, three accidents occurred in succession in uh, the DuPont Bell facility. There was a release of highly toxic gas phosgene exposing a operator and resulting in his death one day later. So that uh, the community be spared the potential health consequence of this type of accidents uh, and uh, they don't have to address the, not only the inconvenience, but the economic hardship. The CSB made two recommendations out of these accidents that merge into one. We recommended to the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources that uh, they establish a hazardous chemical release prevention program. And this we did on the two, as a result of the two investigations at the Bear and at the DuPont. Uh, the objective of this hazardous chemical release prevention program was to prevent the type of accidents that we are uh, dealing with today. The most recent, as you know, is the chemical release at Freedom Industries, which is why we are here today. Uh, 
what we have, we are in the preliminary steps of our investigation. We have learned to date what everybody knows now that the uh, a decades old tank, storage tank, leak as much as 7,500 gallons of a mixture of chemical MCHM and PPH uh, into the nearby Elk River, and this contaminated the water supply of up to 300 residents in the Canoe Valley. Uh, the CSB investigation, while currently ongoing, will most likely examine a number of what we call lines of inquiry. We are looking first at the issue of siting of chemical facilities and storage facilities so near to water sources. Second, uh, the, of course, the mechanical integrity of uh, tanks, of chemical storage tanks. And this including, uh, we, we are bringing our tank experts that are going to be studying issues like anti-leak designs, how to test for welding quality in tanks, uh, what kind of leak sensor should be available to avoid this type of spills, uh, how are safer containing designs could have prevented this type of, of leaks, all this under the, the guise of inherently safer uh, uh, actions that could take in to avoid this type of mishaps. Uh, another is simply a procedural thing of, of to have chemicals for use just in time rather than accumulating in big quantities. That's another inherently safer, safer uh, approach. And also, we would like to look at the regulatory framework surrounding the above ground tanks and hazardous chemicals in the Canal Valley and in the state of West Virginia. The CSB final investigation report will dissem disseminate lessons learned from this tragic accident to help prevent a similar event from occurring in the Cano, Can Cano Valley. Now I would like to invite Johnny Banks, the investigator in charge for the CSB on the uh, Freedom Enterprises investigation to uh, describe to you the, so far the team's activities. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Chairman Moray Russell. The CSP team arrived on Monday, January 13th, to initiate its investigation of the chemical leak at Freedom Industries. First, I'd like to provide a, a brief summary of the incident. On January 9, 2014, a 35,000-gallon steel tank located at Freedom Industries in Charleston experienced a leak of up to 7,500 gallons of 4-methylcyclohexane methanol, or MCHM with an estimated additional additive of about 5.6% of PPH, uh, which is in late terms is a, a glycol ether. An unknown amount of the chemical was released to the Elk River, a tributary to the Canal River. A combination of MCHM and PPH was released at the bottom of the tank 396, which is believed to have been constructed prior to World War II. The MCHM is thought to have entered the soil and eventually migrated to the Elk River. Since our arrival, we have met with company management and are in the process of developing a site control agreement. The CSB has retained an expert in tank design, inspection standards, and practices who will be consulting with them throughout this investigation. We have submitted extensive document requests to the company for site drawings, tank, and dike specifications inspection records, and chemical hazard in information. The CSB staff initiated witness interviews and plans to interview facility employees next week. The CSB's invest investigation aims to determine the root cause of the failure of tank 396 and the surrounding containment structure, allowing MCHM to escape to the Elk River. We will examine the tank design, materials of construction, inspection practices, and regulatory oversight. The team will also be examining the response to the leak once it was discovered. 
We're particularly, in, particularly interested in the adequacy of the information on MCHM and PPH hazards since the manufacturer's MSDS repeatedly says no data available for numerous toxicological properties. As investigators, our goal is to design the, to determine the root cause of this incident. We are committed to our mission of prevention and promise this community a comprehensive report. Thank you. The reason I say that is we're in a 60-day session, so if we need to move forward with legislation, uh, this would be the time in order to have these recommendations, even if as recommendations come forward, uh, maybe not have it you know, comprehensive, but at least if you see where the, there's places we need to address immediately, then this body could act immediately, uh, as of course it would be also longer term aspects as well. So do you have any idea when we would be able to get these lessons learned and recommendations? Sure. Uh, typically our investigations take about a year to bring to conclusion, okay. but there are uh, instances where there are issues that are developed in the course of our investigation where urgent recommendations can be developed. Uh, as we move forward with this one, we'll be looking at information that we gather, and if there were issues that, that came to our attention that determined that we should issue rec urgent recommendations, those can be done in the time frame that you spoke of, uh, 60 days. Okay, because this, this commission would be very interested in those, that as you see the urgency of some of the recommendations that we can act on and, and work on, uh, if, if that would be possible that, uh, that the board could provide that to us so that we can start working on it. Um, the, we passed out last night uh, out of Senate Judiciary Committee, Senate Bill 373, and that primarily deals with the registration inspection of above ground storage facilities throughout the state because we do not have any idea of how many of these things are out there really and also what's in them. And we, have, we, we haven't been inspecting them. So the fear is, is that there could be some tank sitting somewhere ready to do or possibly be already leaking uh, in the ground, in people's groundwater into the system and we don't even know it. Sure. And so there's an urgency about that and so there's other recommendations that you have with such urgency that we ought to be looking at immediately. Would you, would the board be willing to release those and let us start working on those? Absolutely. Uh, there's a sense of urgency in our mission as well. Uh, we, we have to fold in with other investigative activity. Uh, but we realize that the uh, citizens of this area want to know what happened, and we want to deliver that information as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Senator Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Banks, yes. Chairman Rosso, for being here. Uh, you, you made mention of, of, of a fact about products with no data available. We're trying to get a handle on tanks and trying to get a handle on what we have. How many products are out there, chemical products that we we have, there is no data available, something like this would happen. Well, the, the, this came uh, as, a, as a surprise to us where uh, a material could be uh, used and, and not have adequate information that folks need to make those determinations when something like this happens. So as part of our gathering of information, we will be looking at those type of uh, factors. Uh, MSDS, uh, that most companies have material, they should have an MSDS. But if there's a prevalence of a lack of information in those, then that's a problem. So there could be some action that uh, we would recommend to the uh, folks that would have oversight over those uh, products. Have you seen this before? Um, in varying degrees. Uh, this one was striking because it was involved in something that affected such a large portion of the population. Uh, and is there information available on, available on the PPH? Uh, the, basically the same sort of information that we found in the MCHM. And so moving forward, we're going to try to delve into the BPH and see exactly what the uh, toxicological issues are that uh, folks might need to be concerned with. Thank you. We, we are interested. Sit up, Steve. Why don't I add something? Mr. Chairman, come forward, please. Could I ask a comment, Mr. Chairman? 
Yes, sir. Please come forward and make sure you get to the mic. Thank you. Right, right. No, I would like to, to add a comment to, to what Johnny said, is that uh, the primary responsibility to identify what is in these chemicals and what is the toxicity in this chemical are of the people that manufacture the chemicals and provide it for use in industry. I mean, in this case, the company that manufactured this chemical uh, has, you know, has conducted a, a, a uh, <coughs> two or three small uh, toxicological studies in the chemical that are not adequate to determine the chronic effects that could have uh, through exposure to, to a long period of time, and absolutely very little information in PPH. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the federal government, CDC and EPA have been uh, uh, basically badger on the fact that they don't have information in these chemicals. And sure, you know, it's a function of, of the government to, to collect this information, but the primary obligation is the people that put these chemicals in commerce to provide a adequate material safety data sheet with information about what could happen on situations of mishaps like this one. And uh, the, 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 the company that manufactured these chemicals I think has very is very little uh, information that has been provided and is available for the government to collect to to look at this. I mean, the government obligation is to to find out what is in there, but the the the, 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 obli the primary obligation is the people that is getting this chemical into commerce to provide the necessary toxicological information, and that is not happening, and that is something that we are going to be looking very careful. I have a follow up that is small. Yeah, yeah. The PPH, again, we don't know how much of that in your investigation we've been able to determine how much of that has been released, how much of that is in this chemical or in this thing. Will we be able to determine that? Well, what, what we have various information that uh, the analysis of what was in the tank was over 95% uh, 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 MCHM and between uh, 7 and 6 percent of PPH. So what uh, the, 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 the comments that I have read from the CDC said that you will expect substantially lower uh, uh, contamination from PPH since the concentration is so small. But, but it's still, you know, when, when you are dealing with uh, very uh, active chemicals, I mean, these chemicals are created in industry to, to, to be reactive and to do the, the, the uh, chemical work, even on small quantities, they affect uh, human beings. They have the potential to affect human beings, and we should be worried about it. Definitely, they shouldn't be in drinking water, period, at any level. You know? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Okay, Delegate uh, Cooper, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, can you tell us how many states do not have regulations on inspection and registration of tank facilities? I don't have those numbers, those figures at my fingertips, but we can certainly you know, check those and report back to you. Thank you. Senator Walton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. It's been very uh, informative. I, I take it from your presentation. There I am. That you have been to the uh, to the site itself. Yes, I have. Okay. Could you talk to us about the second level containment wall um, and the flooring in the second level containment wall? I've heard mixed things on the news as to what it is, and also if you have any suggestions as to requirements that there should be in place for a second level containment wall. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, a secondary containment wall composed primarily of masonry uh, uh, blocks. Um, we haven't uh, submitted that uh, structure to the type of analysis that we'd like to to uh, determine its integrity, but just looking at it, it's, it's in place. Uh, the intent was to contain any breach of the tank. Um, when we arrived, there was uh, uh, evidence of the, the leak that had occurred in the tank, that there was a material there absorbent along the edges of the uh, containment wall to prevent any more seepage into the, uh, uh, the downslope into the Elk River. 
Uh, we would, uh, as we move forward, we're going to isolate the tanks, uh, put them under uh, really close analysis, but we'll also be looking at the secondary containment as well. Uh, we'll look at the, at the use of this type of uh, a barrier as a secondary containment as opposed to other types of secondary containment that could have been used. And so those would be uh, some of the recommendations that may come out of this uh, investigation is to look at uh, using a, a wall as a secondary containment as opposed to other measures that might be used. I find that very important. Um, I understand, of course, that there was a hole in the tank. Was there any type of holes in the secondary containment wall? None that we could observe with the naked eye, but again, we would place it under much closer scrutiny. So the secondary containment wall failed, essentially? We don't know that the secondary containment wall failed at the surface above the, uh, above the ground. Uh, there could have been seepage underneath there. We just don't know how deeply that, that wall okay. penetrated. Um, as part of your suggestion, would you please uh, be sure to, to get information to us as to what type of requirements we should have in place for a secondary containment wall and for you know that next level of protection for our citizens. Um, you mentioned that um, you, you're, you guys are committed to prevention of future disasters. Um, have you all started looking at other chemicals within the zone of critical concern um, up the Canal River from this water intake system and others in West Virginia? and started analyzing those chemicals? Is that part of your all's plan? Uh, we, yes, we have a, a service, a screening service, and folks in our DC office that gather data that supports the ongoing efforts of this investigation, but it also would look at uh, a more, uh, say, a higher level to see if there aren't these conditions in other communities throughout the country. We, we do have nationwide coverage, and so uh, this is um, maybe a warning to other communities to be vigilant. Do you all know any long-term effects that this chemical, you know, agent or the other one, PPH, has on human population? We have not found anything yet, but that's an ongoing process. And um, I think that uh, the, the fact that there was such concern raised, the fact that it affected so many people, you know, it, it gave us a uh, fair warning that we needed to be vigilant in this effort to determine if there were long-term effects. So that's part of the uh, ongoing efforts. Well, I live in the contaminated zone. Um, I'm a West Virginia American Water customer. I have a pregnant wife and a three-year-old child. Um, do you know of any effects on other women that might be pregnant that are worried about their unborn children and, and what it may have and, and future concerns, what we should look for? Well, I think the fact that there were warnings that came out after the uh, uh, restrictions were lifted, you know, um, spoke to the, the fact that pregnant women were advised to not drink, signaled that, well, if, it, it's just not safe to drink and, until folks can be absolutely sure that everybody can drink it. So uh, I assure you my household, um, my wife's not consuming the water currently. Um, any information as to uh, even showering and bathing in the water with the your skin being your largest organ, any concerns there? Um, well, we only have the advisories that, we, that were um, uh, submitted by the CDC and we'll continue to delve into the, these uh, uh, chemicals to, and if we found that, they, that there were some, some characteristics that merited immediate uh, uh, warning or urgent recommendation, those would go out as quickly as possible. But we want to be thorough before we would make those type of pronouncements. And lastly, um Going back to the water intake systems, is there a, uh, well, our concern has been that if this chemical was odorless and tasteless, we never would have known uh, about it. Is there any type of uh, water intake system notification systems when certain type of chemicals or any other foreign chemical gets into the water system that water companies have in place throughout the nation? Well, that, as, as we move forward, those are the, the type of systems that we'll be examining. We're going to be uh, uh, talking to the folks at West Virginia American Water to determine what type of processes they have in place. Uh, we'll also uh, be consulting with water treatment experts to see what best practices are throughout the country and hopefully there will be uh, some uh, elements that come out of those discussions that will point to what should be in place if, if not in place currently. And uh, I'm sorry, sorry Mr. Chairman, just one more, thank you. Um, this is a for West Virginia, a very large, you know, water company. Um, and it's kind of surprising to me and the multiple people that they've had, from my understanding, only one water intake system for the entire system. Um, is that commonplace that 
that large water companies have only one water intake system? And also, do you know if the water company did in fact shut off their water intake whenever the chemical was released, or did they leave that open? Those are discussions that are ongoing. Uh, as I said, there's uh, multiple agencies that have been involved. Uh, we have an interest in, in looking at the practices of the water company to, to make a determination of, of how those uh, played into this uh, incident. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Stoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the uh, magazines that the Council of State Governments put out about two or three years ago had to do with the top ten major issues. And one of them was crumbling infrastructure. And uh, I know that, uh, uh, again, this was a pre-World War II tank. Uh, there's water lines and throughout my area, particularly southern West Virginia, that were put in there in the early 20th century. And uh, I'm glad that I heard you say, I was, I was going to bring up that this cannot be a totally isolated incident to West Virginia. But this can be a wake-up call for all the other states to use this as a, as a real, uh, you know, sentinel event, if you would. So Absolutely. that we're looking at all these uh, water systems. Again, zone of critical concerns are, are uh, uh, critical concerns. Sure. I, I, I heard you. I was going to bring that up that this cannot be a West Virginia isolated mm -hmm. incident. It is, however, here that this could be uh, a wake up call for the entire United States. And yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that earlier. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with that. And uh, uh, I think that. In this instance, uh, just, and it, it doesn't, you know, completely absolve any concern at all. But uh, the Department of Fish and Game uh, inspected the water and found there were no fish killed. Uh, we look at this as, as you aptly said, a warning. And uh, other communities that uh, may have uh, chemical plants in proximity to uh, water treatment intakes may want to reconsider their proximity or. Make the, the, the companies themselves may want to check their systems to make sure that there is the possibility of a breach such as this, because this, uh, fortunately, you know, we've not uh, had anyone die from this. In most of the cases that we would deploy to, there's been uh, death either in the workplace or the citizens. Uh, West Texas, uh, West Fertilizer Plant had a tremendous impact on the community because of the effects outside the fence line. And sometimes, uh, for years and years and years, companies and, and communities peacefully coexist, and there's one event that really shakes their realities and re reconfigures their, their norm. And uh, we see this in most of the cases that we uh, deploy to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've had to do that you know, several times in this region over the past five years. Uh, but I think there's a, a plea from the, the community for uh, our agency to, to give them answers, and our commitment is to, is to do that. One of the things I make uh, is going to be, I think, what I'm listening to uh, fellow members are that uh, we need to monitor some long-term effects. And I put to the, commit, the commission that uh, West Virginia School of Public Health has offered that up as, a, as a, a tool in our toolbox to help monitor along with the Bureau of Public Health. We need to uh, make sure that that's done so that, you know, consider from a uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, from, from your expertise and experience uh, investigating, investigating accidents in the Kanawha Valley, uh, would it be an accurate statement to say that there's a systemic problem uh, with the maintenance and management of the chemical tanks in the Kanawha Valley and maybe across West Virginia in general? I think there's um, the fact that we have been here over the past five years, three times for events where mechanical integrity has been, you know, prominent in each of those cases, that that is a fair statement. But I wouldn't consign it just to uh, West Virginia or the Kanawha Valley. There's uh, an issue throughout most of the cases that we deploy to where mechanical integrity uh, procedures, systems failures are, are commonplace and, and almost accepted. Uh, I would submit that the odor that's associated with MCHM uh, was one that was smelled before this, this in incident occurred. It just became normalized. And so as part of the, the suite of things that we look at, we look at how things 
drift to a state of being for a period of time, and then there's a catastrophic failure. And, and the question is, how could that happen? How could this plant become so close in proximity to this facility, to the uh, community? And it evolves over time. So uh, we're, we look at all of those aspects of, of an incident when, when they occur. From your investigations across the country, um, have you all been making recommendations to put tank farms or tanks uh, further away from waterways? And, and what distances would you recommend for these type of facilities to be viewed from the waterway? Well, we, we recommend a, a suite of, of things. We would first recommend inherently safer systems. If you're using something that can be substituted with a, a chemical that's less, less hazardous, less toxic, we would advise to do that. If there's a way to isolate the equipment from, uh, from communities, uh, we recommend that. If there's a way to put a barrier between the hazard and the worker, we recommend that. It's, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to the issues that we uh, uh, investigate. There's a multitude of root causes, and there's multiple recommendations that we develop to address those root causes. And it's done in the sense that if those recommendations are embraced, that the likelihood of a recurrence is reduced significantly. What, what kind of cost are you incurring on implementing this uh, investigation? Uh, we have a modest, modestly small budget uh, as an agency of about 10 to $11 million per year. We have a small staff of about 40 investigators. We have um, uh, coverage of the entire United States. And right now, we're in the midst of, of wrapping up several significant cases of Deepwater Horizon. Uh, we just concluded a, a Chevron public meeting. Uh, we have a meeting in uh, Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest at, at the Tesoro Refinery. Uh, so we're as busy as we've ever been in my 11 years at the agency, but we're no worse for the wear. And uh, I, I think that we're up to the task. Uh, we, we need to. Uh, have the, the resources that, that we need to do our job, and uh, uh, I think the support of, of bodies such as this to uh, respond to the recommendations as quickly as you can. One last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, in regards to reporting uh, chemical spills, um, from what I understand, that there's a recommendation to report manually, and I, and I was wondering if there is leak detection technologies available out there uh, that other companies use uh, to determine when there is a leak and if there was anything in place at the Freedom Plant and uh, if there was, what may have uh, gone wrong with that? Okay, there are leak detection systems that uh, could monitor for just about anything that's leaking from a containment. I, at this point, um, I've not seen anything at the uh, Freedom facility to indicate there was a leak detection system, but that's not to say that there wasn't. Uh, as part of our ongoing investigation, we'll make those type of uh, uh, questions part of our, our steps moving forward to determine what type of leak detection uh, system was in place, if it was adequate, and if not, make recommendations to, to address that, that shortfall. Thank you. Senator Lay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to go back quickly to the material safety data sheets. Uh, you know, and again, I think that's important to know what you're dealing with in terms of a response strategy and public health advisories. And I get the sense that uh, uh, some things we know more about than others. And this is indeed one that uh, uh, maybe levels of toxicity and those types of things. And as the chairman says, it's incumbent upon industry to do that before it moves out to, uh, to commerce. But, uh, are there uh, are there minimum standards, uh, uh, sort of thresholds? I guess what I'm leading to, just part of your root cause analysis will include re any recommendations that may be required at the federal level as it relates to uh, uh, chemicals in our commerce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we, as a matter of course, we examine you know policy, procedures, regulations, and uh, we evaluate those. And if there's a, a disconnect between what the standard is intended to do and what actually happened, if there's a gap there, uh, we make recommendations to bridge that gap. And it's a painstaking process, but it's one that uh, we feel adds value to the overall investigation. It has to be a, about more than just a widget break, you know, somebody doing something wrong. If there's oversight that should have been there that wasn't, we want to ensure that moving forward it is. 
and other communities that are watching this will take heed and they'll do likewise. So in your other investigations, in most instances, the MSDSs are a little bit more definitive than in this particular incident? As a, as a general rule, yes. Um, there's um, the, the notion of, of information contained in an MSDS being proprietary. Uh, when folks have a need to know, uh, that information needs to be obtained in some way, shape, or form by, at minimum, the health professionals that would be tasked with providing health care to folks that are reporting with symptoms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions from members? Mr. Banks, we want to thank uh, you and the chairman for being here, and we look forward to uh, working with you. Also, we, we may want to invite you back later as the session goes to talk about maybe some recommendations that you can release uh, to us so we can be working on it until such year. I know your final report will come out with a more comprehensive uh, ideas and recommendations, but we really do want to act on this immediately because there's this uncertainty out there. And I don't think the public here in either Canal Valley or throughout West Virginia will have confidence in drinking their water because what happened here at the state capitol, I'm sure these little communities all through West Virginia are thinking it could happen there too. Sure. And there's, if, if there weren't safeguards and protections here, then surely I don't know if people think that there's any in their particular communities. So in order to try to get confidence back into the re both our residents and also throughout the country, as far as we're protecting West Virginia water, we need to take some bold actions, measured and reasoned, but actions in order to put these protections in here so that everyone, everyone's safe. And uh, we appreciate you being here and, and the board and helping us uh, work through these things. And we want to be an example, as the uh, Senator Stallings said, this is a wake up call not just for our state, but for the entire country, showing the vulnerability that we have in our infrastructure, particularly with our water, that what we do here could be learned and, and replicated across this country. And so let's be looking for that in the sense that we do the right thing here so that others can also follow. But thank you for, for working with us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, just as a closing note, we typically will have uh, interim public meetings. so. Uh, expect to have uh, preliminary findings presented in, in a venue, uh, in a public venue in the area in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have uh, General Foyer of the West Virginia National Guard. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you an update on the guard's role and the interagency response to this particular situation. Uh, as with all disasters, uh, two of the key areas the National Guard is providing uh, support to the interagency team on relate to logistics and operational support, uh, particularly to the emergency response community. Uh, to date, just in bottled water alone, the National Guard as part of the interagency team has helped facilitate the movement of 20 million bottles of water to support our citizens. One thing I would like to point out that this is a local, state, and federal effort that's gone on in an interagency approach. And another group of individuals that I believe that we need to pay particular attention and thanks to those local volunteers, the volunteer firefighters, the scouts, the Red Cross, the VOAD folks, the churches, all those folks are critical to our ability to be able in an interagency and a statewide approach to be able to support the citizens that, that, that need our assistance. Another unique aspect to this particular uh, situation, the National Guard using three unique units, the Guard Civil Support Team, the CBRE Enhanced Response Force and the Joint Interagency Training and Education Center, along with assistance from uh, Guard counterparts in the District of Columbia, Ohio, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, have provided unique capabilities to provide analysis and assistance 
in particular in the sampling and testing process and to help manage the sampling and testing process. And just to give you uh, a, an understanding of the complexity of this, uh, my technical uh, team put together uh, an analogy, basically at the 10 parts per billion level, which is the level at which we as the state decided that we would test to, uh, which is below the CDC threshold of one part per million. Uh, testing at the 10 part per billion level is the equivalent of looking for six drops of water in a 7,500 gallon milk tanker. So that's the level that, uh, of intricacy of the process. And there are a variety of labs and technical experts involved in, in putting that together. Uh, to date, over 1,800 samples. Uh, I will also point out that that interagency group, along with the National Guard, the Bureau of Public Health, some technical experts that we in the National Guard had uh, reached back to, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, Office of Emergency Management, built in less than 24 hours the set of methods and protocols to be able to test for this chemical in water. So another example of the, of the role of the interagency team and the Guard. Uh, again, I know the committee understands that we have the ability and certain expertise, but we must rely on the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry within CDC to tell us at what levels we should be testing for. One of the things we did as an interagency team at the state is when we got that one part per million uh, guideline from CDC, we looked and said, hey, we can go to the 10 parts per billion level in testing, which is lower than that guideline that was provided to us initially. And that was the effort that we drove to first to clear the system at one part per million and then move to the 10 parts per billion level, which is where we're working now. Uh, there is significant redundancy in the sampling and, and testing process that goes on. Uh, though, those data points are then provided to the Bureau of Public Health, the water quality folks who then make decisions related to what we can and cannot provide as the state to, uh, to turn back on certain, certain areas for use. So that's the general process with which we follow. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, first, uh, and I've said this across the country time and time again, uh, that uh, this governor and this legislature support the National Guard like no other state that I've seen. Uh, you give us tuition reimbursement program that allows me to, to train guardsmen to be everything from plumbers and carpenters to uh, master's degree level uh, technical experts. That, in my opinion, is clearly being demonstrated here with the talent that's out there among those 425 National Guardsmen that are supporting this interagency effort. Uh, another point I'd like to point out to you related to the National Guard situation, there is an effort at the national level, particularly uh, at the Department of the Army, to reduce the size of the National Guard. Uh, that could have a significant impact on the state of West Virginia's ability to respond to an event like this or Hurricane uh, Sandy or a derecho event if they come forward in the future. And uh, uh, Governor and I felt that it was prudent to make sure that the members of this committee were aware of that situation as well. Uh, the other last thing I would point out is that uh, we are providing data from the sampling results as soon as we are able to do it in a manner that allows us to provide the information first to the Bureau of Public Health and the folks that have to make the appropriate level of decisions and then putting those online as quickly as, as possible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, again the support of this legislature and I, I realize I'm somewhat biased, but uh, as a member of the National Guard for 32 years, uh, I think that the, the men and women of the National Guard, this interagency team, and those West Virginia volunteers and West Virginia citizens have responded pretty well to a, a, a difficult, difficult situation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. I, I want to commend you and, and all the National Guard men and women that have been involved in this process. Uh, by far, you've uh, not only responded to the situation here, 
but also you mentioned about all the local volunteers, the churches, the organizations. I would say that that stretched out all over the state of West Virginia, not only in the affected area. And I heard story after story of communities that had been impacted by this, but they may have never met anybody in the Canal Valley, but have gathered up supplies and, and the National Guard has been helping to uh, make sure that those supplies are distributed to the people that are in need of this impact, impacted area. And again, I want to commend you uh, and for the work and for all the men and women in our National Guard. Sir, and I, uh, a great example of that is uh, your community of uh, Martinsburg uh, stepped up and provided supplies and the National Guard units in the Martinsburg area moved those supplies to the affected area. And that's going on across the state. Yes, sir. Thank you. Questions for the general? Questions? Well, thank you, General. We, uh, we, the one question I would say is uh, I know you'll probably come out and do an assessment on the response and something like this happening. And of course, at that point, I'm sure you're going to have recommendations of things that we could do uh, to better respond or, or, or to respond quicker and, and to help facilitate that. Uh, this commission would be very interested to see if there's any legal barriers or hurdles or whatever that we can start removing so that if something would ever happen again, what, of course, we want to put provisions in place that will never happen again. But with that, we want to make sure that you have all the tools that you need to respond quickly. So we'd be interested in hearing from you on some of those things. I know when you and I talked that weekend, uh, right after uh, the situation, uh, you, you had identified, as well as Jimmy Jeanette from Homeland Security, uh, about, this, about the above ground facilities not getting registered and having adequate information inspection but the fact that you didn't really know what was out there that would have helped possibly in, in making making your response uh, so that's when the senate clicked in and the legislature to start drafting legislation to address that so we appreciate any anything else that you saw that we could work with you on and partner with you to make sure that the people are safe yes, sir thank you uh delegate Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have one question. Uh, thank you very much for all of your work and, and service to the state of town where um, one thing that I, I'd just like to get a little bit of clarification on is uh, how do you determine uh, where you're going to testing that you're currently going within the communities and how long do you think that you will go on performing testing within the uh, areas that can affect you? Yes, sir. The the sampling process is built on a, a several different factors to include the hydrology of the water system itself. It's a 1,700 mile uh, of pipe water system, as well as a, a variety of other technical factors that the team takes and, and works together to determine the best sampling points to ensure the appropriate level of integrity. And that team, again, includes people with experience in the hydrology of the system, uh, the folks from the Bureau of Public Health, the folks from the Department of Environmental Protection, as well as other experts that, that they relied on, uh, then our guard folks then take that information and work with them to help build a sampling plan that goes into place. And, uh, sir, my, uh, my best estimate right now to, to get through at the 10 parts per billion level to uh, the entire system, uh, the technical team is telling me that that will probably take uh, a, another week to, to ensure that we've met that uh, criteria throughout the entire system. Uh, and we're continuing to work, uh, you know, we're running 24 hours, seven day a week shifts since we came on to this and we'll continue to do that. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, I, I, I'm uh, saying a lot of extra uh, uh, prayers because I've got young men and women out in the middle of the night in sub-zero temperature black ice uh, who are working their damnedest to make sure that we get this done as quickly as possible uh, for the benefit of the citizens of this state. We thank, we thank you and, and them for their service and, and thank you for coming today. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, sir.